Hi, guys. I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. Welcome to the Goop Podcast. Made possible by our friends at Bowl and Branch. Today's guest is Dr. Katherine Berndorf, a clinical associate professor of psychiatry and obstetrics gynecology and founding director of the Payne Whitney Women's Program at the New York Presbyterian Hospital Weill Cornell Medical Center in Manhattan. Dr. Berndorf specializes in reproductive mental health for women before, during, and after pregnancy, which tend to all be times of intense hormonal transitions. Most recently, and most importantly, she co-founded the Motherhood Center, a very much needed destination for pregnant and postpartum women in New York City who need extra support. And she's at work on a new book about the emotional side of pregnancy and postpartum. Dr. Berndorf sat down with Elise Lunin, Goop's chief content officer, to talk about the intersection of reproductive health and mental well-being. Before we get to Dr. Berndorf, let's talk about one of our partners. Hey, it's Elise. A few years ago, we did a story on Goop about organic cotton. In the course of our deep dive, we learned how toxic conventional cotton can really be for the environment and then for our bodies, and just how hard it is to find GOT certified organic cotton, the highest certification in organic cotton farming and production. Not only is Boland Branches bedding GOT certified, but it's fair trade certified too. This means that everyone involved in the supply chain, from their farmers to the factory workers, has been treated fairly. Another reason to love Bull & Branch? The sheets are incredibly soft and only get softer the longer you have them. For $50 off your first set, head over to bullandbranch.com and use promo code GOOP. Now, let's get to Elise in our interview with Dr. Katherine Berndorf. Jumping right to it and the formation of the Motherhood Center, you know, it seems like as a society, it's it's crazy that they aren't on every street corner in a yes. way because it's such a profound shift for so many women and no one talks about it. Bravo. Yes. That's what we were hoping. I mean, what we're finding is that we've created this community. We sort of want to call it the mothering center because I think what women are finding is that they feel mothered. What is missing when you become a mother is often understanding your own experience of having been mothered, right? You reflect back on it and you think, oh, God, I I don't know if that went well or I got what I needed or I didn't have a mother or um, and, and now you have to be a mother. So what we're finding at the Motherhood Center, which I can tell you more about, is really that it's really all about mothering, Mm -hmm. mothering the mother. Mm -hmm. I think that that. I mean, it makes just being a mother myself and going through that transition and handling it better than I actually probably would have expected. But it was still it's difficult to assimilate it. But, yeah, you, suddenly it's it, it creates crisis, even if you have perfect parents. But in that moment of like, what sort of mother am I? What sort of mother did I have? For me, it's like opened up the mother wound of like acknowledging my own mom's shortcomings. Right. Absolutely. It's a huge identity shift any way you dice it. Right. You go from being one person and it's not that you become two, but you sort of people will describe sort of having your heart living outside of yourself. Right. You Mm -hmm. never you are you are forever changed. There is no going back. There's a no returns policy. Right. (laughs) Even if something, God forbid, happens to the child, you know, or there's a loss during the pregnancy, you're still a mother. It never goes away. And that is so profound. I always think before I had kids, I was like, oh, I'm going to have kids. I never realized what, why I wouldn't have kids because when I think about the loss of it, I'm, I'm almost paralyzed. Mm-hmm. It's so profound. It's such an identity shift, but I digress. It's really, um, I think we don't really, it's hard to appreciate unless you've been through it, become a mother. There's this beautiful wor- word called matrescence, which is like adolescence, rhymes with adolescence. And I I love um, these two words. Adolescence is very well known, and people recognize it as this bumpy, changing, tumultuous time where your, you know, your body changes and your attitude and your hormones are raging. And then it, thank God we get through it. Matrescence is the same thing about becoming a mother, right? And our bodies, our hormones, it's tumultuous. But we don't think about it like that. Unlike adolescence, which we respect as a crazy time in life, 
it ends, matrescence happens and is, is um, we don't even think of it. We think of it as this beautiful, blissful, natural, you know, thing that should happen to every woman. You know, it's manifest, it's maternal destiny. It, what? I mean, it is like, <laughs> like nuclear bomb goes, I mean, it's a big deal. And I don't care if you had, I don't believe in perfect parents, but good enough, pretty perfect parents, you know, <laughs> came for you, like your childhood was pretty darn good. Uh, I don't, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to grapple with that shift in identity um, on becoming a mother. And, you know, it, it is different for everyone, but it requires a lot of self-reflection and ability to integrate this entirely new um, person that you've become, and also mourning the loss of who you were, mm -hmm. right? You will never again be a single person in the world. And I think it's that shift, and I, I can't imagine I'm alone in feeling this, but when I, and we talk about this a fair amount on Goop, and I think it's incredibly resonant, you become pregnant through mystical ways. Just kidding. But no, you get <laughs> pregnant. You go to, with increasing regularity to the doctor. You are Ever, there's so much there's so much attention on you how you're doing what's happening with the baby etc you go through this extreme physical experience which i think is sort of like losing your virginity in some ways like there's so much expectation and you're like that hurt and i'm so tired and i'm going to sleep and what am i supposed to be feeling and then you're kind of abandoned the shift is entirely on your child all eyes there all medical care there and you are essentially like a discarded vessel. I just read a quote from an article that came uh, from a colleague um, in the postpartum support international world who said, um, when your pregnant princess becomes a postpartum peasant, mm -hmm. we forget who it, it's all about the baby. And that is true very much of, of, of our um, Western, our North American culture. That is not true everywhere. Mm -hmm. Other cultures do it so much better. Yeah. They coddle the mother. They celebrate the mother. They take care of the mother. And somebody else is helping with the kid. You know, families. It, it, you know, we're a splintered, very, you know, independent. Uh, we don't all live around families. It's, it's just a different um, context. The landscape is so different, but it's also a mentality, mm -hmm. you know, you're celebrated as a pregnant person. Oh, the ba the minute that baby comes out, you said it. You're sort of a discarded vessel. Mm -hmm. But you just went through the biggest, most profound bodily experience you could go through, and then you have, you know, essentially a major medical condition. I, I don't I don't mean to pathologize it, but you know, when you have if you end up with a C, it's like you have surgery, people respect surgery. No one respects a C section mm -hmm. as a surgical intervention for which one needs to recover. Even a vaginal delivery requires tremendous it requires recovery. I mean these are profound shifts in the physical being that we we respect, but we forget about five minutes later and, and all eyes are on the baby. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other, beyond just the fact that your stomach is a boob and <laughs> your boobs have milk, like yeah. you're also hormonally, like the shifts that are happening, the sleep deprivation, just sort of this compounding. We're really selling pregnancy here, guys, I have to say. But <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still it. worth it, but, but it's not perfect. Yeah, and it's interesting because and, and not to totally divert the conversation, but there's been some movement and some conversation about like the invisible world of, of nannies, particularly on social media. And at least for me and, and my husband, we live away from our family and our nanny, Vicky, is essentially like she has stepped in not only as like an ex another mother to my children, but as a mother to me. You know, she takes care of me in a way that no one else takes care Probably of me. Probably ever has. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to function if I didn't feel like, and it's not in like a dither, like I'm going to just be a mother in quotes. It's like cleaning, it's cooking, it's like just caring, doing things I would never ask her to do. Um, she sees what you need. Yeah. And she fills in. Exactly. And, and I'm so lucky that she, that she is in our family. But I think for so many women, 
they don't necessarily, ha- they probably don't have that. They don't have, it's that lack of sort of allo parenting. There's no more village. There's no more, you know, you're alone and there's this expectation that you should be able to handle it that I think is, right. particularly it's, if you're not that maternal. Right. And many people aren't. Yeah. I mean, you know, some people surprise themselves and turn out to be far more sort of inclined and want to leave their big, you know, high paying jobs and others knew that they never were and aren't mm-hmm. or are surprised when they thought they would be and aren't and whatever it is, it is. Um, but you deal with what wh- wherever you are. You have to meet yourself where you are and accept that and, and figure out how to get what you need. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you get it in the most interesting places. Like, who would have thought? I mean, I had a similar nanny experience. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 your words resonate so much with me. Because I used to say, my husband said, you're going to leave me for her. Because I would go in the bathroom in my lotion that I, you know, it, the minute I would finish it, and the next day I would find a full lotion, and I would go to and I would think somebody knew that I needed new lotion. As mundane, it, it brought such pleasure to me. And this was my kids. You know, she wasn't there for me, right? But she was. Yeah. And it was beautiful. And um, that's not always the case. But yeah. I do think it is a very interesting and complex relationship. Yeah. With caretakers. And I think it, it, it is in so many ways essential. And friends of mine sometimes who have, haven't had amazing relationships with their own parents and they're like, oh, my mom wants to come and stay. And I'm like, does she cook? Does she clean? Like, if she can come and take care of you, you yeah. like, the baby is fine. The baby right. is sleeping. But I think that it's that so many women like we're missing that, that no Big one, time. even if you're not a mother, Big time. it's like who is nurturing you? Well, thank you for setting up the motherhood center. So, <laughs> so in a way, what we're finding is, although it is really meant, um, are the, the, the main part of it is a, a day program where women come, women who are experiencing moderate to severe anxiety and depression. So outside the norm, mm-hmm. they come with their babies. We have a nursery on site. So they don't have to separate and they come and they are cared for by us in very, you know, empirically evidence based treatment modalities. But really, we're we're, we are all mothers mothering new moms. Hmm. And that is what really people walk away saying like this. they, They are filled up. They come often on their you know, we've had babies as young as three days. And the moms were very anxious going into pregnancy. And when they, you know, they couldn't, they got home, they couldn't function. They, they needed someone around all the time. It's sort of a place like when you're not kind of making it an outpatient therapy, you're calling your therapist or your pediatrician or your OB every day. Mm-hmm. Okay, come on in. Come on in. We got you. <laughs> we're going to help you. And we hold. It's a holding environment, like Winnicott says. And we will take care of you and nurture you and help you become confident and be able to be the mother to your baby, which is, I think, what most women want to be able to do. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of repair that has to happen, you know, that that we actually, it's funny, we have somebody right now who, who came from a culture um, where she was, the baby was taken and taken care of, and that, that wasn't enough, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I don't want to just glorify other cultures and say we're so horrible. I do think it would be great if we had a better ritualistic process for immediately postpartum where we care while women repair and heal from the delivery. We all need to be mothered as we're looking at our new roles and trying to make sense of it. Who was my mother? What did I get from that? Wow, I actually, I remember saying to my own mother, I can't believe what you did for me. God, I didn't appreciate you, mm-hmm. right? And it didn't even occur to me to say that to her ever until I had my own kid. But it's just such an interesting, complex transition that for many people requires mothering. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't require, it, it it sure sounds nice. I mean, I would imagine like the spectrum of what you're talking about and what's normal. I mean, I, I was pretty high functioning after both pregnancies but I also I, I love that I don't know if you coined it, but that you're bringing you're bringing focus and attention to this idea of postpartum anxiety because I certainly had yeah. that like late nights on pediatric kids cancer pages like donating to any GoFundMe <laughs> I could find you know just yes. just in this vortex yeah. of anxiety yes. and it, it's so I'm so glad you mentioned it postpartum anxiety has so not gotten its due. And, you know, that brings me to the point of, you know, we, we call it, you know, postpartum or postpartum depression. That's sort of the only thing people, if they know anything about it, they'll know, oh, postpartum depression. And then they think about that woman in Texas, Andrea Yates, who killed her kids. Mm-hmm. Wrong. 
She was psychotic. She was out of touch with reality. She believed she was doing good for her kids by killing them. But we, we don't, that's very rare. That is an absolute emergency and treated as such. She, things went very wrong there. That is such a small percent. People, but people are scared to say anything because they're worried it could be that. Okay. But postpartum depression also, the reason I don't think we know about anxiety, the, the way you're sort of saying it is, is right, because the word depression doesn't say the word anxiety in it. So we're trying, I work, with, I'm on the board of Postpartum Support International, we're trying to bring a new phrase in to the lexicon called perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, PMADS. P-M-A-D. It's not catching on that fast, but um, it's more descriptive, right? Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Because it, it, postpartum depression doesn't capture it. So women will come in and say, I was miserable. I was anxious. I was up all night. But I wasn't depressed. So I didn't have that. Well, you had something that was making you not feel good. We could have helped you had you come in, or could we could have identified that as something that, that was worth talking about, not necessarily throwing medicines at you or hospitalizing. Just talk about it, identify it, call it what it is, and then talk about ways to mm -hmm. feel less anxious because anxiety is very entwined with depression. They're, they're, they're almost, I always say they're sort of alter egos of each other, mm -hmm. and they're, they're very related. It's interesting that there's no anticipatory care for pregnant women as well, like you go and it's also physical. And one of the things that's reassuring that you're told repeatedly is that your child is essentially adorable, but parasitic and will take whatever it needs from you. And, and, but in a way, obviously you, you want great medical care and things can go wrong, but that they're in, I was struck by how fragile I assume my children would be and yet how resilient they are in all ways. But no one was like, anticipatorily coaching me at all about what happens on the other side. It, it's hard to hear. Do you think, I'm curious, if you heard it, like it, they're, you know, ready to parent, preparation for parenthood. You know, we, I, I participate in lots of classes, helping pregnant women and partners, you know, get ready. Do you think you can hear it when you're on the pregnant side? This is my wonder. I, you know. I, that's a great question. I think keeping it simple and, and even in a, you don't, you're going to experience many things and they're probably not what you are going to expect. Mm -hmm. I remember driving to the hospital because I was induced both times and driving to the hospital for the first time with my husband who it was at 530 in the morning and, you know, there was no real ceremony. We just got up and I cleaned up some cat puke yeah. and, you know, went to the hospital <laughs> the to have a baby. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I just don't think I'm going to feel anything. And I'm so embarrassed to say that. Wow. And I was like, I think that it's very possible you won't feel anything. Uh -huh. I think that this whole thing is just going to be a mixed bag. Yeah. But I was making it up on the drive. Right. And he ended up feeling way more than I did. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But how cool that he could say that yeah. and not be embarrassed to say that. Because, I mean, many people would be ashamed to say that. Totally. Right? And, and you were reassuring as best you could, not really knowing what the hell was going to happen. And then the experience when it happened, right, it is not necessarily instant love. It can take a while. Again, most of the women we see at the center say, I, I thought I was supposed to feel something. I don't, I don't know what it is. Like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. It feels obligatory, but I don't know. I don't have a connection. I don't know this person. It's not what my fantasy was or wasn't. Mm -hmm. I, I'm totally confused. Do you think that part of that comes from this idea that pregnancy is so prescriptive in so many ways and so theoretically predictable and then everyone gets so caught up and like what's your birth plan and I remember my doctor who's super western like just grandfather OB I loved him he was amazing but he was like don't write. and I agreed with him in, in part he was like you know uh like birth plan like so. that's first way to end up in an emergency c-section and I think he might be right like I, I have seen it ob observed it with my friends where yeah. they have this like very orchestrated beautiful well, if path it's, if it's extreme and it has to go a b c versus flexibility should mm -hmm. be at the top of your birth plan right exactly yeah. okay but but I think that they're I think that we're all conditioned to believe like this will go a certain way or mm -hmm. I have control over this process and I think the more we can sort of shift the focus to from like ourselves. what music are you going to be playing right to um are you going to be in a bathtub <laughs> right listen the best laid plans i mean i don't think it's so awful i mean i i really you know another key point that a lot of people don't realize is 
postpartum depression, anxiety, and all the other s- often starts in pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Interesting. People are like, oh, wait, you can be pregnant and not happy? Uh, yes. Yes, you can. And we can treat it. I'll, I'll get women who come in and they say, uh, you know, they're six months, seven months pregnant, and they'll say, I'm here because I want to make sure I don't get depressed in pregnancy or I don't have, you know, a recurrence of my OCD or my anxiety. I've always had panic disorder. And I ask how they're doing, and they're like, well, I'm having all those things that, I, that I'm worried about. And I said, well, that's great. Let's treat it now so you don't have it in the postpartum, mm-hmm. right? You can help pregnant women. I spend a lot of time figuring out uh, plans, therapeutic plans, medicinal plans if needed. If we need to use medicine, we do. So there's a lot you can do in pregnancy to prepare mm-hmm. for the postpartum. What about for, for women? And this is a, a friend who has a, an anxiety disorder and was great throughout pregnancy yep. and then got really kicked, kicked in the ass. Yeah. A progesterone has a metabolite called allopregnenolone that um, skyrockets during pregnancy and has uh, the effects of an anti-anxiety medication. It doesn't, it is not a guarantee. So don't think if you're, preg- if you're uh, an anxious person, you get pregnant, it's, it's all you know, going to be great. But for some people, they get relief. They, f- they feel calmed at, at some points, and not always. But, um, yeah, the postpartum, after now your hormones have gone to their highest levels, right, towards the end of pregnancy, your estrogen, progesterone, those are skyrocketed. You deliver, and the precipitous fall, it is that delta between the height and the, and the bottom, you know, when you deliver the baby and all the fluid, diuresis that fluid, and then things are trying to re-equilibrate. It's that fluctuation in the hormonal balance that makes almost everybody feel nuts, mm-hmm. right? Those are the blues. That's the blues we know are caused by those that those initial hormonal shifts. But um, and that that that's the hypersensitivity. The mood goes up and down. You cry if someone looks at you the wrong way. That passes. That passes within two weeks. If it doesn't pass. Or you came into it different, you know, not feeling well, then we have a different situation on our hands. But but up to eighty percent of people will have those that hormonal hypersensitivity situation that we call the blues. But to your back to your um, friend, you know, some people, uh, and I always say, how was your pregnancy? If I'm seeing them in the postpartum, and there are women who say, you know, it was I wasn't anxious in the way that I that I expected, but boy. The minute that kid came out, or two, five, ten days later, I was right back to the worst kind of anxiety I've ever felt. We'll have more of Elise's conversation with Dr. Katherine Berndorf in a minute. In the meantime, let's talk about one of our partners. We've written a lot on Goop about the importance of sleep. It's when our bodies unpack and recover from the stresses of the day, and not getting enough of it can be detrimental to our health. An essential part of any clean sleep routine is perfectly crisp yet soft bedding. I think we're all on the same page on this one. At Goop, we focus on GOTS certified organic cotton sheeting, which means that no harmful chemicals were used in their creation, which is definitely better for the environment and also for our bodies. A company that's setting the gold standard in the industry is Bowl & Branch. They use 100% pure organic cotton, and everything is ethically made, meaning that every farmer and factory worker is treated fairly every step of the way. If this all weren't enough, the sheets are incredibly soft and only get cozier the more you wash them. They are a staple at Goop headquarters, and I have them for my baby's crib, for my bed, and for the bed of my five-year-old. So now it's your turn. Bowl and Branch has a little clean sleep challenge for you. Take 30 days to sleep on their incredibly soft organic cotton bedding or return it for a full refund, no questions asked. Head over to bowlandbranch.com and use promo code GOOP for $50 off your first set of sheets. Okay, let's get back to our chat with Dr. Katherine Berndorf. It must be very difficult with uh, pregnant women who, or postpartum women who are have this these fluctuating hormones. Like, how do you find the balance? Like, how much how much of it can you leave to nature to work out? What's your toolkit? Well, in the immediate postpartum, fortunately, nature takes care of you. Mm-hmm. So even though there's this hypersensitivity and cry on a dime, it's a self limiting 
you don't need to intervene in any kind of way other than just hopefully you have supportive people around you who are saying it's okay. Mm -hmm. And they don't mind when you scream at them and they say, I'm a bigger person than that. I can take it, right? That's all. When it goes on, I mean, I know, again, it's sort of a not very well-known fact. We're not completely convinced that postpartum depression is caused by hormones. Hmm. It is more likely to be depression in the postpartum period. Hmm. It is a hormonally fluctuating uh, landscape, at least in the beginning, and around sometimes with breastfeeding and weaning, think there are spikes. But, you know, it's not unlike regular old depression. Hmm. So, so again, it's like, it's not rocket science if we could look at it and recognize the fact that, yes, women who are pregnant and women who are postpartum have don't always feel good, right? We were talking about this before, that it's like supposed to be this blissful, beautiful, miraculous thing. No one likes to pair that with imperfection and reality and struggle and difficulty, right? We can't, we can't believe that that could be the truth. But yeah. And I would imagine, I mean, it's such a mixed bag, right? So you have like some of this like reparenting work and this, how it informs like what sort of parent am I going to be? Then you have the nutritionally, like the intense depletion that Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of women, I mean, a lot of women, I was never even told as much as I love my OBGYN, but at no point was he like, keep taking your post, your prenatal vitamin, Mm -hmm. like particularly because I tend to be anemic, Mm -hmm. like so you don't have anyone who's sort of boot camping you through like a nutritional plan. Yeah. And it's such a mixed bag. Like how do you as a doctor start to take it apart? Well, if you're lucky enough to have a person come to you and you have the opportunity to start talking about these things, you try and look at you back up and you try and look at the whole picture. Mm-hmm. Like how are you doing both, you know, or not but in, in all ways, biologically, psychologically, socially, sexually like you want to look at these different realms that are that that um are is one paradigm a, a way to think about ourselves and how are we doing in all these realms and that includes you know sleep and um nutrition and appetite and energy levels and interest in things and and when you can assess all of that, I mean, as a psychiatrist, I'm assessing all that and I'm also trying to see, okay, where can we, what do we have to do? What do we need to do better? Mm-hmm. Where can I help you optimize, you know, what you're not doing well? I mean, again, as a psychiatrist and someone who treats almost exclusively pregnant and postpartum women or women trying to get pregnant, by the time people get to me, it's often a discussion of to medicate or not, mm-hmm. right? And I always start with, could you be off medications or do you think you need medication? One, I want to know where the person's sort of, what their philosophical stance is. But I also want to make sure they are doing everything they can to take care of themselves and help themselves be in the best place they can be to feel well. Mm-hmm. So what is, what, well, how do you eat? And how do you exercise? Do you exercise? And how much are you drinking? And are you, you know, sort of, what are you up to? And what are your relationships like? And how is your life? And are you, where's your stress? And where can we minimize that and maximize, maximizing wellness, minimizing stress? That is what, you know, that's a, catchphrase kind of cliche kind of way to say that, but I mean, that's what we're, I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. Where are you making yourself nuts that we can think about and pull back on? And where could you do better? And where can I help you think about things you can do that are simple, but not easy, right? Exactly. <laughs> simple, but not easy. And like shifting back, I mean, how do you, how do you take something like the motherhood center and then make it available? I mean, it feels, obviously we, yeah maybe we're we're culturally disadvantaged in the U.S. in terms of how we approach parenting, but how do we start to drive that change? You know, like you think about even just the construct of maternity leave and paid family leave. And it's, it's what, what is a bummer about that whole conversation is that so many women who have not had children yet have no idea. And then you go to your HR department and you to talk about this maternity leave that you're going to take for three months, which is Mm -hmm. in some ways too long and some ways way too short. Mm -hmm. And then you are told like, oh, you go on disability and you're going to collect partial pay or actually you're, you get your, you take your sick leave and then you need to come back. I mean, most women come back to work after two weeks because Mm -hmm. they have no, there's no paid family leave in this country. There's no choice, right? So how do we start to drive 
massive change. And I feel like it starts with college women who don't yeah. realize that oh, this is going to hit them. Totally. We right have to start younger and we have to think of it as a family issue. Yeah. It is not just about women. You know, generally women have partners. Often those partners are men. You know, we need to think about this as a family, as family leave. Every, you know, my husband's Canadian. They do it a hell of a lot better up there, mm-hmm. right? Paid a year. They're going to 18 months, I think, maternal or paternal leave. You choose. I mean, we are. So lately, believe it or not, I've been consulting with some, with, in particular, one hedge fund. They wanted to know, what do you think is the best amount? We want to do right by women. We want to retain women. Mm-hmm. We want to, you know, we, want, we don't want them out because it's obviously costly. So we're talking to them about how to do it better so that they show that they value women and that they have their backs and that they will, you know, how long should maternity leave be? And should you ease back in? Should it be part-time to start? And can you get, you know, days off? Or what kind of days can there be flexible days in there so that when you need to go for child, you know, if something happens during child care, you know, mm-hmm. right? You're dependent on that. And if it doesn't work, you don't go to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So we have to do, this is a huge national conversation that needs to be happening. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's it's one of the, the, one of the most pressing Issues both in you know you mentioned retainment, but so there are not enough women in positions oh. of power driving change at these companies. Nope. And I think people assume it's bad for business, but being at Goop, it's interesting because we're almost entirely women. Mm-hmm. We have a few men, but a, a lot of moms, and it's been incredible because I I for one find it really weird to be disconnected from work for three months. It's just not how I operate. Right. So I have, but at the same time, as you know, it doesn't best laid plans. Like I need to be able to take my kid to the doctor right. and feel like I'm doing my part as a mom. So it's like building in this elastic, you know, assuming the best of people, right. assuming women are like well, multitaskers. At the motherhood center, I, I don't know that we meant to be. We, we are all women except my business partner is a man. I sort of, you know, uh, cliche <laughs> there too. But and we're almost all moms. Some are new moms. And everybody, it's just it, it, the passion that drives people. So we, we have a very much a common mission, a common goal. But nobody, I have not seen anybody have an issue with a kid say, I got you covered. Your kid's out. Leave early. Go. I needed the morning. I couldn't come in. No one's balking. Mm-hmm. Nobody. It's not about FaceTime. I, you know, as the medical director and co-founder, I say to people, get your job done. I don't care when, and I don't care how you do it well, get it done. But leave in the middle of the day. I just left. I ran over here to do this podcast, and I'm going back to see patients. I came from that. I said, I'll be back. I mean, I I do for others what I would do for myself. Yeah. Flexibility to me is the name of the game. And that's life. And and that's the only structure that works for women and, and specifically moms. And, like, having them absent is... Uh, obviously like a national and cultural crisis. And I think we're feeling that like yep. the, the rise of the divine feminine and how yeah. desperately we need yeah. reparented potentially, but like reparented moms who are helping us all mother. Right. We have to respect ourselves though. Yeah. And believe that women have to believe it too. Yeah. And believe in ourselves. And then I think we can make this movement happen. Exactly. And, and support each other, support whatever each other. choices. Yep. Whether you, women choose to work or they choose to stay at home, doesn't like matter. Understanding the dignity in both paths yep. and Respect. getting over it, you yep. know. And yep. I'm, I say that as an imperfect person mm-hmm. who has. We're all own, imperfect. We're all imperfect. Yeah, don't try and say we're yeah. not because we are. Exactly, but you know, I'm totally triggered by yep. the fact that I work and yep. guilt, and but yep. I think it's on all of us. It's a responsibility to sort of deal with it and well, deal with it, it within ourselves. Yeah, because as long as you're feeling guilty, you may be enacting that elsewhere exactly and unintentionally making someone feel bad which of course you would never do but like it happens because of our own guilt so you have to take responsibility i'm a big believer in you know deal with your own shit Mm -hmm. (laughs) and take responsibility for it don't put it out in the world but it would it allows you to interface with the world in a much more healthy way i agree completely thanks so much for joining us for our talk with dr Catherine berndorf today you can learn more about her work on her site, drkatherineberndorf.com, and also check out the Motherhood Center, which is located in New York City, with hopefully more branches to come in cities all over the country. Now it's time for Ask Me Anything. What do you eat on a daily basis when not cleansing? 
what do you always avoid? Asks Alexa. Well, Alexa, I'm basically never cleansing, only if I'm guinea pigging something for the website or I try to do one good cleanse a year. So on a normal day, I'll have a smoothie for breakfast and I have a pretty healthy lunch with some protein and salad. And then dinner, I usually have whatever I want, but I do always try to avoid highly processed foods and high fructose corn syrup. Have a question? Drop us a line at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for this week's episode of the Goop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please hit subscribe and tell your friends. See you next week.